This is the Chicks of Fintwit, a finance podcast by women for everyone. I am your host, Caitlin Cook. Join me as I highlight female trailblazers and their male allies across the industry as each shares their expertise on a variety of finance topics. Nothing is off limits. Thanks for joining us. Now, please enjoy this episode. All opinions expressed by Caitlin Cook and the Chicks of Fintwit podcast guests are solely their own opinions and do not reflect the opinions of the host or any of their affiliates. This podcast is for informational purposes only, is not investment advice, and should not be relied upon for any investment decisions. We are not recommending any securities, nor is this an offer or sale of a security. Hello and welcome to the Chicks of Fintwit podcast, a finance podcast by women for everyone. I am your host, Caitlin Cook otherwise known on Twitter as Dead Kate Bounce. And in this episode of the pod, we have a very special guest, one whose career I've been following from afar for a very long time, really looking forward to talking to her, Denise Schull. She's the author of the book Market Mind Games, is a performance coach who uses neuroeconomics and modern psychoanalysis in her work with CEOs, hedge funds, professional athletes, and more. And also the founder of the Rethink Group, if everything else on that list wasn't enough already. And she focuses uh, essentially on the positive contribution of feelings and emotions in high pressure decision making. So I'm really excited to kind of unpack all of that. But first, welcome to the show, Denise. Thank you so much. I'm happy to be here. So I know I gave a bit of an overview, but I'm sure that you can tell us about yourself a little bit better than I can. So I guess we'll start there. And more specifically, I mean, what was the series of events that led you to founding your own company and being a performance coach for that group of individuals? I feel like that's such a unique path. And how did you get into such a unique role? Yeah. Well, like I quit the real corporate world way back when, because I couldn't sell computers when I was 40 and found this really cool program at University of Chicago, which basically I was able to... um, research like the neuroscience of decision making. And so I was probably going to get my PhD, but I was dating a trader who convinced me to come upstairs in one of the first upstairs trading firms. And then I was just fascinated by like the process of making a market decision. So I did the PhD, read all the psychology, um, kept studying psychoanalysis at night. And the, the pivotal moment was when they asked to publish my master's thesis. And I'm like, you guys are going to look idiotic because it's 10 years old and um, I need to update it. And neuroscience has started to show you we have to have emotion to make a decision. Like There's no decision made. As it turns out there's really no perception even without emotion, but there's certainly no decision. And I was like, uh, yeah, every piece of trading psychology says take the emotion out. So I literally was like, we have a problem and we have to fix this. So I started researching it and then I started talking about it. And then someone asked me to write an article and so then after that, people asked me to coach. And so that's when then I decided I had to start the firm and um, you know, build out a performance coaching and, and really sort of risk perception consultancy, if you will. So Denise, like you started mentioning, um, a lot of people, a lot of research, a lot of literature historically has just talked about completely eliminating emotions from decision-making process, which, you know, from my end, I really don't think that makes sense. I think it's kind of a fantasy. And I would like to hear a little bit more on your thesis for why you should actually do the opposite, why emotions are something to kind of be embraced in and controlled. Yeah. So first of all, you literally can't do it. Like it, it, it's ridiculous. Like people think they do it because they feel confident and they don't recognize confident as an emotion. You don't make the decision on your analysis. You make your decision on the feelings about your analysis. People don't understand that. So if you, if you did take the emotion out of it, you literally wouldn't decide anything um, because you'd have no sense of what the right thing to do was or no confidence. It's a, you know, it's just a mistaken analysis where people see that emotions get exaggerated and people act them out. So they say, take the emotion out of it, or don't act on emotion. What they mean is don't act out the emotion. You know, understand the emotion and what it's telling you. What you have to control is, the only thing you have to control is an action. I mean, one of the things that was so 
confusing to me. Like the first couple of years I was trading was I was, you know, all the trading psychology books, I'd take the emotion out of it. But there was one guy in our office who was a fabulous trader who was constantly jumping up and down and screaming and getting mad and being upset or being thrilled because he had a great, like he was the most emotional person I knew. And he was also making the most money. So I was like, wait, that all doesn't all fit together. But it really is like, it's just like, this has been misunderstood for centuries. Um, the model of the brain has been cognitive behavioral, you know, thinking about your behavior, thinking to change your behavior. Behavioral finance is, is based on a cognitive behavioral model of the brain. It's just literally, we've found out in the last 20 years, it's just not the way it works. Like we make decisions on how we feel about things and how we expect to feel. So like a perfect example, I mean, I have a, a chief investment officer, CIO of a $50 billion fund who's been in the business for, you know, 20, 30 years. He says to me a couple of weeks ago, um, he goes, so wait a minute. He goes, I think maybe like I tried so hard to control my emotion that I lost access to my intuition. It's like, exactly. <laughs> you know, if you just cut yourself off from any piece of information your body gives you, you know, and you try to be completely in your head, you do lose um, access to, to true gut feeling, which is actually expertise. Like it, so that's a whole other discussion, you know, because a lot of behavioral finance will give gut feeling and intuition a bad name. Net, 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 you don't make a decision based on your analysis. You make a decision on how you feel about the analysis and what feelings you expect to get if you make the decision. It's called anticipatory affect. And it's just a complete like upending, you know, if the sun used to rise in the East about brain science, it now rises in the West. Um, or I, even though I think it's the most analogous to is flat earth. Like we've just had a flat earth view of human decision-making and most people still do. And the earth is round and you have to have emotion <laughs> to make a decision. Like, well, the earth is round is a different discussion for another podcast, perhaps, because I do know a couple people who might argue that. For Yeah, I, I've, I've heard that's <laughs> become more of a, 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 an issue again. But. Talk about fighting intuition in your gut in science. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Um, well, I am, you know, I like that you mentioned kind of the fighting of your emotions. And I almost would think that taking that, you know, mental capacity and the energy that goes towards fighting off all of those emotions would definitely lead to suboptimal decision-making, which I would assume you agree with, but I, is that sort of the thesis of your book market mind games as well? I know that's a little bit more specific to traders and investors, um, and kind of embracing those emotions as opposed to fighting them off too. Yeah. I mean, the, the point of the book is your brain is using what you perceive as your emotions as information. So therefore you're better off to know about it than not know about it. And as you said, you're always going to lose that fight. Well, you didn't exactly say that, but you do always lose that fight. Like it only, you know, eventually you act the emotion out in one way or another, or worst case, if you don't act it out, which is even, you know, it affects your health. Um, you can't, the energy involved in what we experience is emotion which is a piece of information that really has meaning to us is it's going to be itself known sooner or later in one way or another. Yeah. So and the more you, yeah, go, no, go on. No, go ahead. Sorry. Well, the more you resolve that you both want to know what information the emotion is trying to, to give you like that you really want to understand it really boils down to that. I always say you just, you need to get in the habit of what am I feeling and why am I feeling it and getting both answers right. It's an easy question to say. It's not an easy question to answer. But when you do get both sides, what and why, right, you always, 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 always more information, more choices, and you, almost always you're calmer. Like it doesn't matter how bad the what and the why are, when you really are caught at that point, using your cognition, using your intellect, using your intellect and analytical abilities to understand the feelings and emotions. You are so much more well-informed about what your situation is. 
and so much more able to make choices that serve whatever your purposes are. Versus if you're not and you're just trying to straitjacket yourself, you lose a lot of information and then eventually it comes back on you. So to take it, I guess, a step further from that, you know, asking the what am I feeling and why, which I think are super important questions that at least I know personally, I do not ask myself enough. From a coaching perspective, do you find yourself typically having the biggest difficulty with that next step of um, like fighting kind of your inner thoughts on inner biases, I guess, on, oh, this isn't my fault and kind of putting the blame externally when you're trying to reflect on what you're feeling and why sort of pushing that off to into other parties. I'm not sure if I worded that the right way, but. Yeah, I, I mean, first of all, you know, if a client's paying me to help them for the most part, they're inclined to want and help. Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, like I can think of one client that I have who is really resistant to knowing the truth, but for the most part, they really want to know. And the problem that I see more than trying to shift the blame is actually taking too much blame is, is being too self-critical. So like I have a client who started working with me last November, professional portfolio manager, very learned to be very self-critical, you know, no matter what he did growing up, it wasn't right. Um, and he hired me partially because he didn't make money during the bull run of 2020. He made money in the downshift, but didn't make money. And we we're really beating himself up and really lost confidence over the fact that he bled all this money in, you know, from April to December of last year. And then I come to find out that in April, he had gone to his firm to put on this big trade, which I can't explain, but this big trade that would have been extraordinarily bullish, but had all these different legs to it. And because it's such a big firm, he had to get all these approvals for it and didn't get approval for it. Well, the fact of the matter is it's not his fault. Like he needs to, he needs to realize that his, what he actually tried to do in the market and was prevented from doing was the correct thing. Like to just say that he never saw the bull market and he missed, isn't actually an accurate representation of the facts. Now he's disinclined to shift the blame. You know, I should have found that way. I should have done another trade. I should have fought harder. I mean, that, that's the problem I deal with more often than not, is getting an accurate representation with the, for the client, like what they've really done. And more often than not, people are blaming themselves when they shouldn't be. That's a great example. Because I mean, he's in a huge, huge, huge firm. So like the internal firm dynamics of that really were a big deal when he couldn't do the trade. And you know, then he felt like a month had gone by and maybe he'd missed up the beginning and all of that. But getting him to give himself credit for the fact that he really did try to put on a hugely bullish trade has been really hard. And I, I deal with that constantly. Like, and where does a conversation like that even start? I feel like that's like deeply rooted issues stemming from youth or some sort of, you know, incident, or I guess it depends on the client, but. Oh no. Are you kidding me? Everything stems from growing <laughs> up. <laughs> um, no, seriously. Like what we now know about the brain is we're always predicting and we're always predicting based on our past experience and the primary past experience that matters the most in high risk situations or high pressure situations is the experience we had growing up. So we get these expectations of like how we need to navigate risk and uncertainty, what we can expect to get from the world, you know, how perfect we have to be, all these kinds of things. And Unless it's revealed or made explicit and examined, people repeat that stuff. They repeat it in terms of expectations. And so they think they're getting it even when they're not. But then if you react to an expectation, you create, you end up creating the same thing. You know, you, you get kind of what you're expecting. So, I mean, I generally talk to my clients twice a week for a year at least. And I always like figure out what their growing up story is, like how they 
you know, were they the only child, the oldest child, youngest child, you know, how critical were their parents? What were their formative experiences? Like, do they feel worthy of being successful? Or like I have another client whose father liked to go to the casino and take him to the casino. And we, we've been putting, piecing together how when he was like eight or nine or 10 and was in a casino with his dad, he felt like sort of confused and out of control. And like, like, and sometimes when the market gets really difficult, he has that same feeling of like confused and out of control and unable to manage. Um, always. Always, always, always. People have these emotional narratives, these storylines. And, you know, you're moving a billion dollars. If it doesn't really matter, I mean, you can be moving $200, but I mean, and, and it's uncertain and it's ambiguous. And it, like those storylines come out to play unless you've examined and understood them and are able to start to pull them apart from the present. And, and it, when it's, it's all said and done, that's what I do every day. But in practicality, that is helping people trust their intuition. Like if I just had to sum it up in one sentence, it's like the other day I said to another client who's coming back off of medical leave from COVID actually. And she's like, okay, like how do I boil this down into my process? I'm like, you first just keep asking yourself, what do you really think? You'd be amazed how hard it is for people to answer that question. Or, you know, they, there are, that, so what do you really think you and how much do you believe it? Um, but again, that's a variation on like, what's your intuition? And how do you, se so how do you separate that historical emotional narrative from your analysis of what the market's gonna do? That's the quest. And I think the answer is starts with awareness of what that emotional narrative is really about. And you do that with learning the answer, what am I feeling and why, and accurately. Yeah. And I think especially on, I know you work with a bunch of different types of clients and I'd love to get into that, but first it's so many people, just more of an observation really than a question, but so many people, even just from social media and, you know, a lot, you know, from finance, Twitter, right. There are a ton of traders. There are a ton of, you know, more long-term investors, PM, CIOs, and it always has blown my mind how much people try to boil the markets down to numbers when, in my opinion, and, you know, if anyone ever decides to listen to me, but I just, it's just such a people psychological game. And I think that people go a little bit too hard on the analytical data side of it when it really just boils down to, are people making rational decisions? Well, the answer to that is usually Probably, probably not, especially when money and something so emotional like money is involved. You know, you're not necessarily going to be making more rational decisions. You're probably going to be a little bit more emotional. So I it's very refreshing to hear, you know, uh, admitting how much the psychology of it has such an impact on the decisions that you make, especially in, in trading, because that always has been an observation of mine is people love to think the opposite, that it's a science that you can just boil down to, you know, a discounted cash flow evaluation or something. Well, it, it is amazing because, I mean, you're so right. Look, at the end of the day, the only thing anyone cares about is what is some other human being or some other algo driven by some other human being going to pay for an asset in the future? That's the question. Mm -hmm. There are a thousand different ways to get to the answer, but that's the question. It's, it's what is some other human being going to perceive? So it's 100% a psychology game and 100%. A, a, so what people don't realize, just as you say, um, is the number that drops out of their spreadsheet, you know, for future cash flows is not the answer. It's only a clue. Like I have another client who's got 20 analysts who work for him. And we literally constantly talk about how he can train those. Analysts. He's a really good trader. Even though he's really a PM, but I mean, he trades and he even uses a chart and whatnot after he does all his other analysis, but like how we can teach his analysts that it's not the number that drops out of the spreadsheet. 
There's also brain research that shows people who are the best at predicting short-term price movement, believe it or not, in this particular study, which was done at Caltech, aren't using math at all. Zip, not a none. They're only using their, their theory of mind. And theory of mind is the like term in psychology for other perceiving other people. You have a theory of their mind. So I quote that study all the time. Um, you're absolutely right. So I have to ask, now that we're getting on this topic, with all of the sort of meme stock pump and dumps from Wall Street Bets, what is your opinion on that? I feel like people are absolutely dumbfounded as if this is the first time that a market has ever acted irrationally or that groups of people have moved stocks of companies that don't necessarily deserve it from a fundamental standpoint. I'd love to hear your take on that. Yeah, you know, at the end of the day, it's, it's like anything, like it's always been that the professionals could move the stock, right? Because they had the capital. And, you know, hedge funds tend to run in the same kinds of stocks and whatnot. So as a group, they could move a price of an asset. It, not necessarily, I mean, sometimes intentionally, but not you know, necessarily. Um, so guess what? There's a new group. And there's a lot of them and, you know, they may have just a little bit of capital each, but, you know, there's millions of them. So to me, I, like this is, ne- this has not surprised me one iota from the beginning. <laughs> okay. There's a new group and like they collectively have power. I did have a client 30 years in the business manages a huge hedge fund who kept saying, kept being confused. And I was like, there, I had trouble answering. I was like, I don't know. It's a bunch of people whose money adds up to something that matters all taking the same side of the trade and the price is going to move. Why is this hard? I will say I shorted GameStop and it's one of my (laughs) best all-time trades at 350 and bought it back at 85. Um, Purely on like my market research amounts to seeing the headlines, you know, (laughs) and now, (laughs) but, but, it's literally that. So you haven't, you know, you could look at Wall Street Bets as a new hedge fund that has whatever amount of capital those people have in totality. And like when they all want to move the market, it's going to move. Like it's not complicated. I mean, it, 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 but like, you know, if you believe the market moves on, you know, discounted cash flows, then you're confused. Well, two, two things there. One, for compliance purposes, do you still have that position open on, on the GameStop no. there or AMC? No, no GameStop. And then after, way back after that, <laughs> I yeah, see Bobby in the background here, like compliance. Um, so <laughs> the other part of that, though, I mean, it's, it's super refreshing, right? Because I, even I, you know, not, I just get random people from Twitter, you know, not, no expert whatsoever. But it's just so interesting how much people tried to complicate that. That entire situation, the multiple times that it happened when it's really just the power of crowds, it's not new. Like you said, new that it's from a retail perspective versus like institutional investors that have like those, you know, much bigger accounts with some more zeros in there. But it's it really is just large groups of people can manipulate the market and it doesn't have to make sense. Since when has the market made sense? That is That was my reaction every single time that I was asked questions about that whole situation, just because it's really nothing new. And people love to kind of assume that everything is like a first and that it's this big mind blowing event. But really this has happened in, in different ways, dozens of times before. Look, it, 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 it makes me speechless. Because it's like, really, the price that's printing is nothing more than the result of collective perception. There are bunches of different categories of clues, discounted class, cash flows being one, charts being another, you know, information on a meme stock. There are bunches of different categories of clues of what that price should be. But at the end of the day, it's just the collective perception of the money that's playing the game. And there is no, there's no, 
it's not an E equals MC squared. And, and, but so many people are taught that somehow it is, and there's some mystery to it. You know, I mean, a, a really great example of that is um, Renaissance Technologies and their, you know, 20 or 30 or 40 years now of jaw-dropping returns. But the guy at the Wall Street Journal, I can't think of his name right now, but he did a, a book on James Simons or Simmons. I never know which one it is. Um, when you read that book, like all they were doing was seeing patterns like short-term trading patterns and exploiting them with computers. Um, like they weren't doing it. They didn't come up with some E equals MC squared. And if anyone did, it's them. And if anyone ever thought that there was, it was Renaissance. But they didn't. You read the book and it, like I'm reading the book and I'm going, I saw that pattern in 1995, but I didn't think to apply, you know, thousands of computers to exploiting that pattern. That was their genius. Not that they came up with some mysterious, you know, rule of the markets. Um, I, we could talk about this all day. This is one of my favorite subjects. I have so many questions for you though, specific around, you know, just being a coach. I have a ton of thoughts here, but you know, have you multiple questions, but do you approach things differently for the different type of clientele that you have? I mean, they're all high performing in kind of high stress situations. You said CIOs, athletes, managers, you know, that sort of thing. Do you approach things differently um, depending on, you know, the different line of work that they're in, or is the approach essentially the same regardless of what the actual work is? Yes and no. Uh, sorry. Um, I mean, the first thing I think is I always just want to, I want to understand the person's experience of their world and their, you know, their emotional experience of their world and how self-critical they are, how confident they are, how intuitive they are, how maybe analytical they are and how open they are to knowing what they're feeling in life. But obviously, if they're, if they're in the markets, it's a different kind of... So I, the analysis that goes on in my head isn't that different. But what I talk to them about is going to be different than like I've had the, the privilege to work with CEOs of some medical startups this year. Um, so, you know, we may be talking directly about other people or clients or whatnot. But having said, like, what's going on in my mind, the experience of their world, you know, how open are they to knowing themselves and their emotions is pretty much the same. But how it sounds is different. Like, I don't have some list of questions I go to or some formula, you know, we really are about meeting people where they are and, and then figuring out sort of what level of emotional sophistication will take them to the next level in whatever their challenges are. Athletes are a little bit different. Um, the game of sports is so much different than the game of markets. Like, it's so much different. People think it's, you know, the game never ends in markets. You never know whether you're right or wrong, you know. It, sports is so much more specific and so much easier from a mental point of view than markets. But it... it in sports, it's about helping people be able to have their negative emotions, their fear, frustration, disappointment. That's true everywhere else, but it's more just sports. Have you ever had to turn away a client? If they're just not oh my fit? gosh. <laughs> Probably tons, right? <laughs> I'm sure you're approached quite a bit. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the way we work now is my partner, who happens to also be my husband now, uh, he takes all the incoming calls. And so he makes a judgment about whether this person or situation would be best suited for me or one of our coaches, which are John and Evan. And then he also does some coaching sometimes, or we have an Olympic athlete who's done a little bit of coaching for us, our former client, Lindsay Jacob Ellis. Um, wow. Sometimes. The truth is we probably let people figure out that there's not a match more than we, I mean, I've run a waiting list most of the past year. So I personally haven't taken that many new people, um, but John and Evan. Um, so we make a, he makes a decision 
you know, the, the better question probably is like, have I ever had to fire a client? And the answer is yes. <laughs> Not very many. But like there's this one hedge fund that I worked with for, I don't know, two or three years. And the CIO was just never going to get it. Like he was just never, ever, ever going to get it. And then one of his investors pulled some money and he wanted me to lower my prices. And I was like, I'm not really going to do that. And I knew <laughs> he had him. Mm-hmm. So he thinks he fired me, but. <laughs> sort of softens the blow. Do you, um, I, what's the biggest challenge that you face when you're coaching? If, if you can pin one down. Oh, uh, resistance. Oh, it's resistance. It's, and resistance, psychological resistance, but specifically what we call an intellectual defense, where someone's always in their head and they have an answer for everything. So they want help with a given problem. But no matter where you lead them or what kind of, you know, what kind of way you try to open their mind to the emotions you can see they're clearly experiencing that they are clearly acting out, that are clearly getting in their way, they have a reason for. And so they block you at every turn. Um, That's a really difficult one because those people are always really smart and they've always really thought a lot about their situation. They really do want help, but they won't allow themselves to get help. Um, but you can't like one thing, even though we can be very psychoanalytical and, and interpret, you know, why someone's doing something based on their childhood with someone who's intellectually defended, you can't do that too much. It's too threatening to them. So that's something we do very specifically in that we very much judge what someone's resistance is and just try to chip away at the edges a little bit, as opposed to a lot of coaching mentalities would try to bust right through it you know, and force someone to see something and tell them they have to do these things. Like we don't work like that. You know? mm-hmm. we, don't, we don't want the back, the psychological backlash. It doesn't help the person in the end. Did you see an increased difficulty during COVID with all of your, with your clients? I mean, that was such a difficult time for, for everyone for a lot of different reasons, but from a coaching perspective in terms of sort of wrangling in your emotions within your business or, you know, being an athlete, did that, did you find that that increased difficulty? I mean, I feel sort of funny about saying this, but the truth is no. And also maybe the opposite things became easier for people because they weren't traveling and they were trading from their homes. So they didn't have to you know, like I, I have multiple clients who would go to Asia every three months. You know, that's just such a difficult trip to make that frequently. So the fact that people had more time, um, <laughs> there's also the phenomenon of like portfolio managers and CIOs, you know, trading now from their home office or, you know, their bedroom or their basement or whatever. Frankly, weren't as irritated and annoyed by their chief economist or their analyst or their risk manager. Like I had one client who the COO said to me like one month into it, referring to the portfolio manager. Okay. He's never coming back into the office again, ever for the rest of his life. (laughs) This has been so much easier and so much better. So, I mean, yeah, obviously COVID lockdown has been really hard on so many people. But if if they didn't get sick and they were able to stay home and just trade, for the most part, my clients were... Now, you know, the whole market going up when the world seemed like it was melting down, that's a whole other... But that's a typical problem of being in that job. (laughs) So... So I, I do want to shift shift gears here too, but I guess first from, you know, a behavioral standpoint and a decision-making standpoint for any of the, really anyone, even if you're not a trader, an investor, an athlete, just for, if you're a human, I guess, what would be your parting wisdom for those listening when it comes to, you know, confronting tough de- decisions, being under high pressure and just 
you know, taking control of your emotions? Well, I'm going to say first, you only have to take control of your actions. Um, (laughs) You have to understand your emotions, literally learning to answer that question. What am I feeling and why? And it, when you get it right, even in a really stressful situation, the stress should dissipate somewhat, even when the answer is really unwanted and unpleasant. There's something that clicks in the psyche about when you know what you're dealing with. And then you can say, okay, this is really bad, but I know what it is and let's outline the choices. And where people get into so much trouble is trying to avoid the realization, like, this is really bad, or this is really hard, or I'm really scared, or I'm really frustrated, whatever. Like, it's all the trying to avoid that and trying to talk yourself into that it's okay, that creates all this static. And usually all these bad choices that don't solve the problem. So, but it's a, it's a skill to learn what am I feeling and why. And it's a skill to learn not to beat yourself up because it's not how most of us been taught. That is for sure. Well, that is a perfect way to wrap up that section. So thank you for that. Uh, lastly, you know, I have to ask, we talked about this a bit offline and I'm honestly just fascinated. So um, for those of you who are familiar with Denise may know about her ongoing lawsuit in, a, in regard to the TV show Billions. I, I'll let you maybe give a, a, a very, very high level summary, a short you know, a short version, just because as difficult as that may be at this point, um, I will just throw out there. The only reason I followed this is because of you. I find it's a crazy story to me. I've never actually watched Billions myself, which might be blasphemous to some of the people I, I know will be listening to this who have watched. But if you could just give, you know, start off with a quick overview of, you know, what, what this is all about. Yeah. So the short version of what it's all about is they clearly used my book to create the character and to write many scenes in which she speaks in her professional capacity as a performance coach. There are countless scenes where she's talking about intuition or instinct or confidence that you can find a very clear snippet of that in my book, which is written as a fictional story, my training psychology book. So, I mean, there's, you know, years of backstory, but finally I was persuaded by a lawyer to file, file a copyright case. Um, as it turns out, copyright is nearly impossible to win and it's extra impossible to win when you're fighting a big media company like CBS. And so the case was dismissed basically because the judge didn't even analyze the right questions like, like we were saying offline. The judge analyzed, is the story in Market My Games the same as the story in Billions? And of course it's not. We're like, our argument is that her professional dialogue is in large part co-opted from my book. We're now in the appeals court trying to get the dismissal of that turned over. There's another case pending, which is called false endorsement, which is the fact that the public is confused and does see her as me, which is what caused me to even admit that I consulted way back when, because I couldn't say it when the show first came out. Um, it's complicated legally, but that's called an amended complaint and the court rejected it. And what we're asking the appeals court to do is, is to allow that complaint also to go through. Um, now I can go on and, you know, Sorkin invited me to work with, at Maggie, the actress, I was in the writer's room. They asked me to continue to work with her. They asked me to do joint marketing with them. And then I pointed out to the showrunner that my book was fiction. And that's when the whole thing started to go sideways. Um, I didn't realize why. Um, it's because they perceive there to be a bigger copyright exposure if it's a fiction book than if it's a nonfiction book. And he thought my trading psychology book, he assumed my trading psychology book was nonfiction. So then what it appears, what the facts say is that they then set to wipe me off the face of the planet, meaning stop me from having any financial media. So like, if you look in the whatever, 10 or 12 years prior to this event, 
you know, I was on CNBC, Bloomberg, Fox, in the Wall Street Journal, in the New York Times, I don't know, 20 times or something. If you look subsequent to that, once. And the once is when Sorkin was trying to persuade me not to see them by putting me on TV for five minutes, which he cut short for two and a half minutes and asked me about North Korea in the two and a half minutes. So I've had in the since, and then I'll stop, um, since it started, in earnest, it started in sometime during, well, it didn't really, really, really start until the summer of 16, which is ac- after the first season. I could give you a list of journalists who like wanted to interview me or wanted to write a story about me, or I was formerly friends with, or producers I was formerly friends with, ghosted. I, yeah, their intent was to make it so that I didn't ex- exist, so that people didn't see that she was me. This, this is now stuff that we understand that I didn't understand at first. Um, and I frankly just want my day in court. Like, she's from Ohio. I'm from Ohio. My first coaching words are, are you eating and sleeping and exercising? I could have the order of that wrong. Hers are, are you eating, sleeping and exercising? There's one of them is a synonym she uses, like, I can't remember, diet. Like maybe I might say diet, sleep and exercise. And she says eating, sleep and exercise. It's the same. The odds of that are like 0.003% that that was random. Never mind they invited me in. Never mind that I was on Squawk Box when he was writing. I mean, like, come on, people. But as it turns out, it's really hard to be, you know, David or Denise fighting Goliath in the court system. And we'll see what happens. Well, first of all, wow. I can't even imagine. So, you know, I'm so sorry that you're going through that. That just has to be the most difficult thing. And it's been ongoing for years, which is just kind of even hard to sort of process from my end, obviously not having gone through, but (laughs) thankfully have not gone through, but I mean, it's, yeah, I have a lot of thoughts, but one, it's just almost the price of, and I don't want to say price, like this is something to be expected, but like the price of fame and notoriety and being brilliant almost is that the the threat of your ideas being stolen and putting things out into the public for for everyone to see and how easily that can be misconstrued into someone else's content so easily and then you know like you said versus Goliath that was going to be my first question right so the success rate of you know the individual or a small team versus corporate America like versus the big guy I just have to imagine that that in itself is such an uphill battle what inspired you to actually take on that fight? You know, I know you're very bright, very rational. I know that you know that that's super, super difficult to overcome. So what really kind of was the tipping point for you on that? It, it really was there, like trying to wipe me off the face of the planet. Like, you know, I'm a, I'm a individual female who started a consulting company who's, you know, been lucky enough and worked hard enough to have some amount of success. And I had used the fact that I, you know, I can speak well and I can go on TV and sound interesting, or I can be interesting in an article as marketing, because I don't have a big marketing budget, but if I get a journalist to cover me, that's marketing, right? And they took that away from me. And I, I was just like, I'm sorry, I'm not going to let you just get away with this. Like, now I have a lot of women in Hollywood who say this is done to everybody and it's done all the time and have encouraged me to fight for it. But, and when it was first dismissed and I was deciding whether I was going to appeal, that was part of my calculation. Like I didn't, I thought, you know what, like I've lost, like everyone else loses, but I have the capacity to continue fighting and it's the right thing to do because there's like, it is so hard even to get to the point where you file a lawsuit, to find the right lawyer, to spend the money to file the complaint. It is so hard even to get into court. And now it turns out it's nearly impossible to win in court. I mean, I don't know what will happen with this. You know, I have people tell me all the time that a TV show should be made of just of my experience with it, regardless of how it turns out. Um, I mean, I was thinking to myself yesterday, 
there's not anything I can do about fighting the way the court system works, really, you know, really, um, as one person. Um, then the other thing that I have to remind myself, I mean, I don't have to do it so much anymore, but like, I know the truth. You know, there are plenty of women who think I'm just that crazy woman suing billions, trying for 15 minutes of fame, and plenty of people who think that because Brian Koppelman, the main showrunner, has told people that. Like that whole group of male human performance people out there, you know, that are all way more famous than me. He's had them all on their podcast, on his podcast. And I'm sure, you know, I'm a crazy woman who's suing them and who thinks Wendy is based on me, blah, 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 blah. I, you know, it's, I know, I know what the truth is. I know what the truth is. And people who know the story, I had to be even convinced of the truth. Like it was other people who were like, Denise, can't you see what's happened to you here? And I didn't, I didn't know how Hollywood worked. You know, when they first ghosted me, I just thought, I mean, I was super busy doing our intuition brain game and I just thought they were busy. Like, it wasn't until I actually wrote Maggie, who I developed some sort of relationship with, when the show first came out, and there was some review saying how the show was so great, and it was specifically her, and it was specifically that she was the, in this unique role. And I sent her, you know, I obviously have her email, and, and I sent her a note, and like how great and how happy I was for her, and said, not a nothing. This is after, you know, I knew about her kids having the flu and she's asking me if she can take my test and, you know, will I continue to work with her? And I'm like, oh my God, she's been told not to talk to me. So I, I knew then, which was at the beginning, but this, oh, wait a minute, that wasn't, but I, and then I thought we had a truce for the first year, like that I could just tell the truth that I consulted and they were never going to speak to me again. And then they started it. I mean, they sent me a cease and desist letter and said I couldn't say that I consulted. And then I had to hire a lawyer. And then once I hired a lawyer, they're like, that's when the lawyer started to say, do you realize what's happened to you? And I was like, uh, I guess maybe I don't. <laughs> I just don't even have any any words. I, I guess just the one question that I have from all of that, and I have tons, I'm just kind of speechless from all of it. It blows my mind that this is even real. I do think that you should make a movie or a TV show about it, but I'm wondering why, why would they care at all if people knew that you consulted on the show at this point? Well, I think there's a couple things. I think what actually happened is when I told Brian Koppelman, Market Mind Games is written as a fictional story. He had been sued for copyright before, and I did over rounders. I didn't know that that was a thing, like that a fictional story was a greater risk of copyright. So that sent off crazy alarm bells for him is what I think happened first. Second, what happened is he and Sorkin had a complete split behind the scenes. Like they worked together at the beginning, but then I guess they couldn't finally you know, I was told by someone they couldn't negotiate finally over the money. And then I was told by someone they couldn't negotiate over who was getting total credit. And so they had a complete, complete split. What I have been told is that basically internally, like Copeland tells Sorkin that, that he's got to take care of it and pay for it. And Sorkin says, I'm not taking care of it and paying for it. You take care of it, and pay for it. And so there is war behind the scenes. And that's why it's gone on this long. Or, or so I've been told. But I think the short version is the copyright exposure. And then also, I think it's possible that Brian didn't know Andrew used my book. I think that's possible. And Brian had this kind of mythical version of Wendy. You know, she's named Wendy because of, um, oh gosh, what's the Wendy? Just, I want to say Wizard of Oz, but it's... Uh, oh. Anyway. One of those fictional stories where Wendy is the mythical creature, kind of. Um, and so th there's some version of him not wanting a real person. I mean, that doesn't actually add up because they're the ones who ask me and they're the ones who asked me to be involved in the marketing. And so like when they wanted me to be involved in the marketing, obviously there was going to be a real person. So, but I've always suspected that he just wanted her to be this like 
mythical creature. Um, so that's just my own suspicion. I think it really is the copyright. The copyright exposure explains the crazy behavior in the writer's room because he went ballistic when I told him. And then the supposed split behind the scenes between them kind of explains why they have just let this go on this long. But I don't actually know. I mean, the truth, of course, <laughs> I don't. And I'm speculating as to what makes sense. Well, I suppose it's all you can do, right? You may never know, which is, you know, probably one of the worst parts thinking about that. But yeah, I guess because it has gone on so long and because there have been so many people who've weighed in now, you know, lawyers and people in Hollywood, I do feel like we've pieced together, you know, probably what the situation is that, you know, the best explanation for the facts, but it's obviously always something you don't know. And I mean, I would really like to know. I used to say what I wanted was to look Brian Koppelman in the eye and go, what the fuck? You know, like, really? Why? <laughs> like, why? Um, I don't really so much care to do that anymore. Like, I just, you know, people ask me what I want and I've always said, I just want what's fair. I, well, I first want my name to be cleared. That's the part about this. And I think that's the part they don't understand. Is I'm just, I am not going to um, give up until I have no other options on the effort for the truth to be known and for me not to be the crazy woman who's suing billions for my 15 minutes a day. That's, so I think... When you have a motivation like that, it's different than having a motivation for money. You know, yeah, I would like paid some fair share of, of my contribution to that critical character. I don't think that's a, that's a perfectly fair thing to want and to ask. But what I really want is my name cleared. And I think, I think above all things, that's, you know, certainly well-deserved. And I'm definitely going to be, you know, following along very closely with all of this, as I'm sure a lot of our listeners will after this, you know, feeling really inspired and, you know, wishing you nothing but the best, of course. So Thank you. I think, I think that, you know, would be a good, a good place to stop for all of this. Um, I mean, thank you so much for your time. I guess the last part, you know, you like to have a fun question at the end of all of these, right? So <laughs> what do you do in, if you have any spare time at all, because it seems like you're doing a million different things, but what do you do to decompress? Um, <laughs> I would have said this even before your campaign, I go outside. <laughs> <laughs> like a good I, word. <laughs> I moved to a ski town so I could go outside and ski, you know, and now it's either get on my bike or take a hike or take a walk. And in Sun Valley, a walk is a hike because you're up and down hills all the time. So yeah. Other than like organize my to-do list, which I admit like helps me decompress, but. That is soothing. <laughs> I, I really didn't say thing. that for you. Like it was true. I, you know, we love to hear those candid endorsements of the get outside campaign here. If anyone's not familiar, go to bonfire.com slash get outside, not an ad, but thank you for that. I'm with you there. And lastly, where can our guests or our listeners rather, uh, find you to follow along with, you know, your personal journey, your lawsuit, and more, most importantly, your thought leadership in the space. Yeah. So my company is the rethink group and it's the rethink group.net. Um, and I'm on Twitter and basically everywhere else is Denise K. Scholl with my middle name. Uh, yeah. yeah. Thank you well, so much. Yeah. Thank you for, thank you for being on the pod. You know, it's an honor. I've been following you for such a long time. So really, really glad that we got to connect and hopefully I'll be making a trip out, out West to go ski in here. I'll let you know. <laughs> yeah. 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 You need to come out West. It's, it's a completely different experience since I remember that you haven't skied in the West yet. We can get outside together. That would be quite the collab. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Thanks for having right. me. Yeah. Thank you so much again. And thank you to everyone for listening and we'll see you next week. Okay. Bye.